So hello my friends, Devon Lennox here, Photography PX. In today's video, I want to do our long-term ownership review of the Fujifilm X-T200, which I have right here. In this video, we're gonna cover some of the pros, the cons, and the additional findings that we found over the last three months that we did not cover in our first hands-on review, which by the way, if you wanna see that video, you can find that in the description box down below. In that particular video and the accompanying blog post, you'll see more the pros and cons, some niche and nuanced features that I'm not gonna cover in this particular video. You'll also see the competitors of the X-T200, its current price point, and how it competes relative to other similarly priced cameras. But with that out of the way, let's talk about more of the long-term ownership with this device and my perspective on the camera. But I want to show you guys a gallery of images on screen right now of some of the highlight images that I've taken so far with this camera. I, I am in the process of considering selling this camera just because we also have the XS10 uh, by Fujifilm, which we have had for about a month now. And we will be doing our hands-on review of that and then some more videos related to that camera as well. Um, so I do have two Fujifilm cameras in in, in studio right now, so I may very well be getting rid of the XC200. But before I do that, I wanna do a series of videos on this camera so you guys know before purchasing it, whether it's a good camera for you. Now, with that out of the way, if you do wanna see a video demonstration of the capabilities from the footage that this camera produces, you can look at our Fujifilm X-T200 hands-on video. In the video section of that particular video, you can see some example of the autofocusing performance in video and also the video quality itself. Uh, but with those out of the way, I do wanna definitely confirm and say, after shooting with this camera for the last three months, this camera is absolutely excellent from a photography standpoint. Uh, now I'm gonna do, I will have some caveats later on in the video. There are some cons with this camera that may be potential deal breakers that I definitely did not know uh, beforehand when we did our first written review and our hands-on review when we first got the camera that I'm definitely gonna cover in this video. Uh, that may actually be a deal breakers, but besides those couple of things that we'll talk about, and you can also see that in the timestamps, by the way, in the description down below, you can just go right to the cons if you'd like. But before we get to that section, I do wanna get some of the pros out of the way. Um, after shooting with this camera, I can say it is absolutely an excellent hybrid camera. It is great for photography. It's actually a very powerful YouTube camera. If you wanted a, uh, a Fujifilm camera with the film simulations um, and you wanted that kind of uh, natural color aesthetic, it is missing some of the higher end profiles from the XS10 and the X-T4, X-T30. Uh, it is missing some of those things, so it's not ideal, but uh, otherwise it is absolutely excellent for the price for um, taking photos or doing vid video as a hybrid uh, shooter. Um, I can confirm that the image quality on this camera is absolutely excellent. It is not quite as good as the X-S10. I will do a separate video detailing the, the differences between these, the, the Bayer sensor that's in this particular camera versus the X-Trans 4 sensor that's in the X-S10. There is actually a difference. It is not gigantic, but the older Bayer sensor doesn't have the same image quality as the X-S10 and the X-T4 and the X-T30, which all have the X-Trans 4 CMOS 4 sensor. Uh, but that, that's a totally unrelated thing. Uh, but outside of that, the image quality, you're not gonna really notice that. It's very fine, fine minute differences between this and Fujifilm's flagships, uh, APS-C cameras. Uh, so I can say the image quality is absolutely fantastic. The video quality is fantastic. Uh, there are some caveats with the video that I will definitely be covering uh, that may not be so fantastic. But from a quality and a capability standpoint, this camera is excellent. Also, from a, a camera that's in this mid-range uh, entry-level eh, enthusiast price point that's somewhere between 450 to 800 USD, uh, this camera has excellent ergonomics. Uh, as you can see here, uh, the ergonomics on this camera are fantastic, much improved over the X-T100, which definitely lacked uh, this this entire section right here, this grip, it was just flat. Um, huge improvement in terms of ergonomics. The rear thumb rests on the back of this camera, very comfortable. Uh, overall, I feel very confident shooting with this camera. I feel very confident uh, shooting low angle. Another thing of note, uh, this is the largest varying angle touchscreen that you can get on the market at 3.8 maybe five inches, I don't remember exactly the details there, uh, but it's over three inches, uh, no issues with glare. But the user interface is excellent, the touch screen is responsive, the autofocus is great, um, face and eye detection work great. Um, this camera's good, so I, I don't really have anything to say about that. I haven't found any specific capability standpoint that I, I find that are cons. But with the pros out of the way, I do wanna talk in detail the specific cons with the X-T200 that we didn't originally discover and detail in our hands-on written review. But 
the first thing that I want to discuss um, is when you have the XC200, if you're using a lens that already has an included aperture ring, such as the, uh, the 35 F2 that I have on here right now, um, basically what happens for whatever reason, I don't know if this is an overlook from a firmware standpoint, or maybe it's just a purposeful uh, omission, I'm not entirely sure, but what happens is that this front command dial right here basically gets relegated to not available for use. So this rear command dial right here uh, controls your shutter speed, then you have aperture control right here. But if you want to change ISO, you have to actually use this, this, this custom dial over here, um, which normally would be the dial that you would change the film simulations on the camera by default, but you have to use this to change ISO. But there's no way to custom map ISO to one of these dials which from an exposure triangle standpoint, having you know aperture right here or shutter and then ISO, it would be a lot more convenient than over here. And additionally on that standpoint, I always don't remember what direction to turn this. So I always end up overshooting the ISO. And if you're shooting street, it's kind of one of those situations where you may miss the moment uh, when you have to change your ISO in that fashion. So uh, that's definitely for me, it's a con just because I feel like there could be a more intuitive way to change the ISO on this camera. It is quite a, a hassle and it's a little bit tedious. I'd rather there be a different button or if I can use the, this back button and then just rotate the front dial or press and hold to rotate to change ISO, that would be a lot more uh, functional because if you're shooting like this and you have to rotate it that way, and you're not using the rear screen, you're, the rear screen's actually on the back like this that I have to protect it. Uh, you have to look through the viewfinder and it's just it's just awkward. It really is just awkward. So uh, that for me, definitely con number one, that could be a potential deal breaker if you find yourself shooting a lot of run and gun situations where you have to change the ISO while you're shooting. Uh, it will absolutely be a little bit cumbersome and a little bit frustrating to use at times. So definitely keep that one in mind. Con number two that I wanna talk about is that when you're shooting 4K on this camera, uh, there's two ways to do that. You can actually use the manual mode that's on the mode dial here, or you can actually scroll over and you can go into the video mode that's here. Um, something I, I feel that was an overlook here, when you're using the video mode, there's actually no way to manually control the shutter. So with that, the camera actually basically changes the shutter speed on the fly as the exposure metering, wherever you have it set on the front display, if I'm using the center display, it uses that as a, as a measure to change the shutter speed, which basically, as that change occurs through the video, it does it through steps and you can actually see the exposure changing and it's very jagged and it's very choppy. The only way, and this was definitely something that we didn't figure out for almost two weeks, I had to really look into this. Uh, the only way to bypass pass that specific issue is by going over into the M, the manual mode, and then setting up your, your ISO, um, or actually not your ISO, but your aperture and your shutter speed manually here, going over into the main menu, going to the video menu, the subsection, and then changing your ISO there. Um, now that for me is a potential uh, deal breaker just because it's very inconvenient if you're doing run and gun to have to stop the video, then go into the menu to change the ISO. It's not something that's particularly convenient um, if you want to do that quickly and smoothly. Uh, so that's another definitely consideration that you're gonna want to keep in mind uh, depending on your use. That may be a deal breaker. I'm just gonna be honest about that. Uh, it may be a deal breaker for you, I'm not sure. For me, it's just very, very inconvenient. We're shooting outdoors and then we go from outdoors inside for whatever reason and this camera's on a gimbal. It is very, very inconvenient. So think about the way that you use cameras and, and think about that particular uh, inconvenience there. The next thing that I want to talk about, and this is gonna be a comparison, I will do a dedicated video specifically showing examples of this, um, but the Bayer sensor, I had mentioned this in the beginning of the, the, the video, the Bayer sensor on this camera is definitely not quite as sharp as the X-Trans 4 sensor that's on the XS10, which I have right here. Um, and understandably, this is an entry-level camera, so I'm this is not necessarily something that would really be a deal breaker, but it's something that I, I do want to let you guys know it's it's not as good. Um, the main reason you would actually see the difference in image quality besides really fine detail when you're pixel peeping in Lightroom or Photoshop and you're doing a one-to-one -one comparison, you're really looking, um, you will see the difference there. But when you're shooting outdoors with this camera and you shoot into a light source, say you're shooting at night, we do a lot of street photography, um, you're basically gonna see the flares and the quality of the flares is not as good. 
Um, the quality of the, just the images at night, especially when it comes to flares coming in lens, even with the same lens, uh, you, that, at that point you start to see that the images are just not as sharp. Uh, in daylight, you don't really notice the difference between the X-Trans and the, uh, the Bayer sensors between these cameras that much. Um, if you're shooting, shoot, shooting studio uh, inside and you're using strobe, that, that's another kind I'll talk about. Uh, but if you're shooting inside, you're not going to really notice the difference. But if you're shooting outside at night, uh, you will notice a difference between the quality of the images between these two sensors. And I will do a dedicated video specifically detailing this with, with examples and showing that. The last and final con that you're going to want to consider besides that, however, and this is very much a deal breaking con if you shoot indoors and you are a studio photographer, whether that be food or product, commercial, uh, fashion, beauty, these kind of things where you're relying on external light sources. This camera does not, this hot shoe on this camera does not support external flash units from what I've seen. Uh, now, ultimately, there is a missing connecting pin on the X-T200 that is actually present on the X-S10. And without that particular connecting pin, the X-T200 has no way of connecting to external flash units. Um, the, how I originally discovered this issue is that I happened to use Paul C. Buff. Uh, we just happened to be using them. Um, I have the CyberSync transmitter right here. Um, this works on every other camera I've ever used, uh, Canon, Nikon, uh, Sigma. This has worked on um, uh, some Sony cameras. This has worked on other Fujifilm cameras. Uh, but on this particular camera, it does not work. It doesn't matter where I put this. Uh, it doesn't It doesn't matter if I slow down the shutter. It's not a shutter related issue. Maybe the shutter sync speed was too high. No, it's not that issue. Uh, literally, there is a connecting pin. The d design of this hot shoe is completely different than the design of the XS10. And because of that lacking, it's actually missing two pins, but because of those lacking pins, the camera has no way of identifying these external third party accessories that rely on this certain type of connections to power these devices. So uh, essentially what happens is that you cannot use external lights. Uh, there's no way for me to trigger a strobe. Um, and the only way I can trigger a strobe is by using the pop-up flash and then triggering the, the light that way, uh, which is going to cast a light on, on your subject. So it's pretty much, uh, unless you're using this as fill light, uh, you're going to be in a situation where that's probably not going to work. Uh, it's very unlikely to work unless you're outside and the light is very far away. Um, but for the most part, you're going to be in a situation where that's probably not going to work. So uh, if you do rely on external lighting sources, triggers, strobes, um, uh, I would definitely say make sure you research that to see if your your lighting source is going to be compatible because as of right now uh, Paul C. Buff has been in the market uh, the camera market for probably 30 years they're a very much a well-recognized brand they're not a third-party just knockoff brand so for me that is a deal breaker because uh, that means I cannot shoot portraits or food photography inside with the X-T200 I have to use LED and that's not always possible but that is my verdict of the X-T200. I can say this is absolutely overall, besides the cons that I just covered, uh, this is an excellent camera. So uh, if you're not in a situation where those couple of cons that I just mentioned are going to be deal breakers for you, then I would definitely still encourage and recommend you checking out the X-T200. Uh, for the price, this is definitely the best value in Fujifilm's entire ecosystem, uh, besides like maybe an X-T30 or maybe getting a used X-T20. Uh, There's just really nothing else like the X-T200. It's, it is absolutely an excellent camera. Uh, it's definitely a camera we've recommended a lot of times and for a good reason. It definitely deserves high re recommendations. Um, like I said, I may very well be selling this camera just because we have the XS10 already. Eventually we'll get an X-T4 um, and an X-Pro3. We'll probably pick up a bunch of other cameras. So, uh, you know, I don't really need the extra camera, so I'm probably gonna end up selling it, but ultimately I wouldn't sell it if I didn't have the XS10 and I didn't have other, other cameras that are on our radar that we want to check out for long-term uh, ownership reviews. But if you are in the market for an entry-level uh, enthusiast aim mirrorless camera that has excellent image quality, that would work as a hybrid um, that you could definitely use as a vlogging camera or a camera for YouTube, um, then this is a camera to consider and I would still highly recommend it for those mediums. Just keep in mind the specific cons that I mentioned. Just make sure those are not going to be deal breakers to you. Uh, if they're not, well, this is definitely a camera to consider. So there you have it, my friends. There is my three-month long-term ownership review of the Fujifilm X-T200. 
If you have any comments, questions, or concerns, or feel like I have overlooked something in the course of this video, please let me know in the description box down below. Also, while you're down in the description box down below, we've launched a new brand called PXPresets.com. PX Presets is going to be your next one and only stop for Lightroom presets until we launch Photoshop and other platform presets. But here you can find both desktop and mobile presets to get you started in a variety of different mediums more powerfully and upgrade your imaging and take your images to the next level. That link to pxpresets.com will be in the description box down below. Please check that out if you're in the market for some exciting Lightroom presets. But until then, I've been your host, Devon Lennox. I will see you, my friends, in the next video.